Hello beautiful community, it's a pleasure to be with you and we're going to do a bit of a theme and variations and touch on a few bits all to do with Mr. Putin's brutal and disastrous war. We're going to take four questions that I've dug up from um, various social media DMs and I'm kind of random in how I scroll through that so if you wrote something seven months ago to me there's still a good chance I'm going to um, fish you out and answer you. Um, and the four questions today are F-16s to Ukraine, what's your view? Um, how did Russian propagandists degenerate this badly? Um, what about Russian vloggers who do lifestyle stuff and don't support the war but don't go on much about it either? And what about images of war and images of the loss of life that we see? How does that affect us and how should we go about watching it or avoiding watching it? Before these questions, I want to say something about Mr. Navalny's intervention today or the, the intervention made on his behalf potentially or plausibly is his, in which um, he or his Twitter account said that Mr. Girkin is a political prisoner in Russia. Why did he say that? What is he trying to do if it is in, indeed him? We'll break that down and we'll get past the um, activist theatrics on Twitter because if what Navalny said is actually good or terrible, um, it's not going to be good or terrible for the reasons that people who are ventilating about it on Twitter, um, for the reasons that, that they're putting forward. We'll look at why that's the case. But before I want to start with a quote that um, I may have even shared with you a long time ago, but I came across it again and it struck me from Gleb Pavlovsky in March 2022, so a few weeks after the war. Um, and Mr. Pavlovsky was an insider who then became an outsider and a visceral critic of the regime um, who could himself be reasonably criticized. But he had this unbelievable love of political process, which is why his analyses of the extraordinary functionality and dysfunctionality of the Putin regime were always so illuminating. This is Pavlovsky. One reason for the war is that Putin felt he no longer had the support of his circle. The decisions were being taken without him, that gradually control was shifting into the hands of that circle, and that the only solution he could find to this was military escalation. Now, I'm not going to analyze or contextualize this properly, but let me just make a couple of observations quickly. First, the more somebody knows about Russia, the more they're likely to center the regime security story in explaining the war. And the less somebody knows about Russia, the more they're going to center the national security story in explaining the war. Notice, right? Second observation, however we evaluate this, there is quite a bit of truth to it. And what we said a few weeks after the war and some of the videos I think on the main channel is that in starting the war Mr. Putin brought some of that control back into his own hands but his grasp over it was really fragile. Let's do Mr. Navalny now and I've got to apologize I haven't slept last night for health reasons so I could confuse Mr. Navalny with Mr. Putin and Mr. Putin with Mr. Prigozhin and Mr. Prigozhin with Aristotle uh, but hopefully we'll get there. One of the weird things about my condition is that uh, systematic rest is actually more restorative than sleep itself so it's it's not as um, to somebody with a very serious health challenge not sleeping could be ap absolutely catastrophic uh, and for me as a one-off it isn't so but we could confuse Prigozhin with Aristotle. <clears throat> so Navalny 
or rather his Twitter profile, has produced a thread calling Girkin a political prisoner. Here are my quick thoughts on why Navalny's account tweeted this and what we should make of it. From now on, when I say Navalny, I mean plausibly Navalny, but possibly Navalny um, indirectly or even very indirectly with the help of his team. Um, because, I mean, we have had cases, again, plausibly, where Navalny said things that it seems unlikely that he's actually said himself. But here we're going to plausibly say that <clears throat> could be him. So first, what did Navalny actually say? He said that Girkin has been legitimately sentenced by the Dutch court, but is illegitimately arrested in Russia, making him a political prisoner. Acknowledging the Dutch verdict, Navalny adds that, on top of that, he wants an investigation in Russia, presumably in a future Russia. So why is he saying this? Because, of course, Girkin has been arrested for political speech. But this intervention by Navalny is bound to seem strange to Western eyes, even if one looks beyond the theatrics on Twitter, the activist theatrics that, um, as we'll see in a moment, um, can't evaluate whether what Navalny said is good or bad because they aren't connected with what seems to be plausibly its intent. So what is going on? Navalny, or his Twitter account, is saying this to politicize the Russian space. This is not a moral intervention, demanding due process for a ghastly war criminal. It's politics. Navalny is trying to politicize, sorry if I was too quiet before, is trying to politicize the Russian space to get things moving. I'm going to throw in a little chink and then see if, the, if these inter-elite conflicts um, are exacerbated by my intervention, right? So that's politics. Um, against the background of paralysis and depoliticization affecting some of the Russian opposition, any political act might seem welcome. This may be an idiotic attempt at politicization by Mr. Navalny, but that's what it is. Or is it? So when I say that's what it is, I don't think I'm making a professional judgment, and epistemically I think it's really important to emphasize that. Um, I'm making a plausible interpretation, the real value of which is that it's very illuminating to make it, even if it's false, right? So why am I saying that it's not a professional judgment? Well, I'm saying that because um, there are journalists who have immediate access to Mr. Navalny's team, um, and they could ask who wrote this privately, what was the intent, right? That is not my expertise. So what I'm doing is that I'm making a very educated guess about what this is, um, but my real expertise comes in not in that assumption, but in the analysis of what then follows if that assumption is true. Um, this may be an idiotic type of politicization, but that's what it is. So is it idiotic? Well, let me say two things. First, as... Um, Alexander Jokic pointed out before me on Twitter, um, Girkin, and this is my word, this is my language, Girkin is not a victim separate from the regime. He was a parasite feeding on the regime, trying to tilt the regime in a certain direction. Come on, Mr. Putin, militarize our society, militarize our economy faster, move from this sort of, uh, you know, pro-war to a pro-victory position. Um, and Mr. Girkin competed for power, right, within these bizarre conflicting networks um, that sprouted um, in and around the regime. So he's not an external victim. 
um, you can plausibly see Mr. Girkin being arrested as the regime eating itself up. And that is um, a kind of objection to Mr. Navalny's position, but Mr. Navalny could then come back and say, well, I'm just trying to shake things up. My second point here is politicizing the Russian space is bloody hard. And most of the Russian opposition, I, I tragically argue, I hope not permanently, but I tragically argue, are not doing that. So we should not be surprised that the very few people who try it will be engaged in a hit and miss exercise. And quite frankly, it's going to be an exercise of 19 misses and one hit. Um, so what this means is that, until we know more, it makes sense to assess this as a politicizing gambit, um, which is why all of the um, uh, theatrical Twitter ventilation, how dare Mr. Navalny say that Mr. Girkin is a war criminal, um, much of that actually misrepresents um, uh, Mr. Navalny's uh, immediate concession that uh, the uh, sentence Girkin got in the Dutch court is legitimate, according to Mr. Navalny. But then Mr. Navalny complicates the waters by saying he needs a second Russian uh, investigation, right, on top of uh, Girkin already having been given the verdict in the Netherlands. So this seems domestically aimed. This seems aimed at politicizing the Russian space. And that's why objecting to it in these sort of self-congratulatory moral terms is, of course, understandable because Ukrainian folks in the information environment may need to do that. They might think that serves their interests. Um, that's a longer conversation, but that that's where we won't go now. But uh, for us, we've got to see it as, a, as an attempt at politics, possibly an absolutely dreadfully bad one, but one nevertheless. And th this is why I'm pushing this distinction so, so hard with you, right? Don't interpret a politically uh, a political uh, gesture. Um, why am I saying this? Now, this is n not because um, we first and foremost care about what happens in the Russian space. We care because it affects global security. It affects Ukraine's security. It affects the security of Russia's neighbors. And we're not saying that because we care how uh, Ukrainians talk about the Russian opposition. We care about that too, but that's, that's not us. Um, we're very deeply compassionate to Ukraine's cause, but we start with the understanding that we've got to keep our democracies, and unless we do that, nothing is possible. And if we engage in deeply politicized thinking, even if it is about a conflict that's not immediately on the territory of our countries, um, we are cultivating a depoliticized way of engaging that could contribute to us sleepwalking through threats to our democracy, crises our democracy be going through, um, when we in fact need to not sleepwalk but be wide awake so that we can react. That's part of the reason my channels exist, to prep us for that scenario as eyes wide open type of citizens. Questions? Uh, Vlad, you haven't expressed your views about the F-16s um, being given to Ukraine. Do you have a view about how much this changes? <clears throat> um, I do have a view that this doesn't change um, as much as it changes, it doesn't change the basic parameters of the equation that I um, recommend which is that um, the West is committed to Ukrainian independence, but not committed to a Ukrainian victory. It's committed to Ukrainian independence plus, as I put it. Um, military aviation is not something I can comment on. I used to be obsessed with it as a, as a small kid when I lived in Israel for a few years. And I remember thinking a lot about the 
F-16 in the early 90s. Um, then I got bored with it. Um, obviously, there are going to be questions about what the tech and what the avionics will be inside these things, because it's a machine from the 70s that's gone through uh, an enormous number of iterations. And the more modern the version uh, that Ukraine gets, uh, the better. But that basic equation doesn't change. The F-16 does not mean that um, Ukraine is being put in a position to win. just doesn't mean that. Um, can you explain the mentality of Russian propagandists? Solovyov presumably wasn't always like this. So one question is, how do they get here? And the other question is, what kind of state are they in now? Are they saying what they're saying because they mean it or because it pays? And I think very often with such questions, a good answer is um, they mean it because it pays, right? So it's um, advantage generated sincerity, right? Um, and we've had many conversations about the structure of this, right? When we've talked about algorithmic and audience capture drift on YouTube. Well, this is on a much bigger scale when you deal with these Russian propagandists. In terms of how they got into it, um, certainly with Solovyov, who anyway has less sincerity now even than the other propagandists. I mean, he could be bought off very easily um, if he were given a, a big check and some kind of security guarantee he could start broadcasting about um, how we need a Ukrainian victory. Um, it, it, it's not inconceivable. But somebody like him um, comes in with much more mercantilist aspirations and power aspirations and career aspirations um, and not that much sincerity. He's probably got a bit more sincerity now, um, but of course what any good philosopher would say is that sincerity is not a guarantee of authenticity. Um, and then a couple of people have asked me a question about, um, I think, a chat that Anna did about Russian vloggers um, who vlog about lifestyle, who don't support the war, but don't deeply engage with the war. And can I comment on this? And I'm not sure I can, except at a distance, but I, maybe maybe I can give a version of an answer. Um, so, I mean, to understand some of the vloggers, you need to, first of all, grasp the deep depoliticization of Russian society, but also um, the, the, the paralysis that is palpable in a lot of these circles. Um, there's a kind of paralysis, a kind of immobility among a lot of Russians, along lot of Russians who are out of Russia, um, and they've still not quite got everywhere they need to get. You can make of that what you want. I can talk you through more of um, my analysis of, 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 of these processes for them. Um, beyond that, case by case, because what's the professional responsibility of a vlogger? Well, it depends on what kind of a vlogger they are and if they're a professional at all. Um, so there's also a risk here that we're going to be talking about, you know, Ricky, Bobby and Harry. Well, what's, what's the significance of that? You know, so Bobby's not doing a good job with his flip phone video as well. Um, but I think where this becomes a much more generalizable matter is when you get to distinct professional responsibility. And that's when you get to professional filmmakers who are filmmakers 
who are self-consciously more than just entertainers. It doesn't mean they have to be artists. It means they have to have something more than just entertainment to their project. Um, perhaps some kind of a social conscience or some, some kind of a seriousness. Um, and these could be documentary makers. These could be feature filmmakers. And here, my instinct and people much better placed to judge than me, um, like the wonderful Russian filmmaker Vitaly Mansky, um, who has made films about Gorbachev, or about Yeltsin, about early Putin. Um, his sense is that, that, that there are some blocks and pathologies going on there. Sort of, um, we don't support the war, and the best thing we can do is just to sort of stand aside and engage with some issues about how life in this village is like this, and how, um, you know, um, Ivan is working through with his divorce and his alcoholism and so on. Um, so there's a kind of an absence of the war as a, a, something that structures the background. There's a, th th there are issues that arise there of professional responsibility. Uh, we'll talk about that more. Um, are live images, and several people um, ask this, are live images of the war bad for us? Um, and what harm could they do? Um, well, you know that on a personal level, I'm very big on all of you emphasizing buffers, right? Not exposing yourself to stuff that's going to be bad, right? Like, you know, it's going to be eaten, you know, s too much junk food, too much poisonous food. Um, so you want to be careful about what you what put in your body. Mm. There's a promiscuousness and a kind of gamification of um, sort of loss of life and death, of course. And that leads to the question more directly, which is, what should one do when content one um, is faced with or when one that subscribes to follows is giving one images of human beings losing their life? And my advice here, of course, is two levels. Number one, Mental health, mental health, mental health, mental health first, right? Really. So buffer self-protect according to your personal needs. Everybody's needs um, are different. What's easy for you could be difficult for somebody else and the other way around. Second, a formula that I am um, enthusiastic about is actually that... Um, what you should try to avoid is not seeing it, but seeing it with a level of casualness and a level of consumerism, if you like, um, which irreversibly depletes the dignity, right, of the human loss of life. So to put it kind of cartoonishly, you know, if you've seen 17 videos that you maybe should have seen, maybe shouldn't have seen, but you could just consumed them. Um, you know, think about looking at Goya's, the disasters of war, or Picasso's Guernica, um, to reconnect you with the three-dimensionality of right, the, the, the event of a death. So funnily enough, I'm not saying don't engage. I'm, I'm actually saying don't engage or engage properly, but try to minimize the consumerist um, promiscuous relationship. And, you know, that's that's hard, of course, also, 
for um, any society that lives through a war. And because Mr. Putin has imposed this war, um, brutal war on Ukraine, this is going to be a challenge that Ukraine has to, to face, this sort of routinization of, of the loss of life. So this is my couple of cents. I'm so grateful you've, you, you've held it there with me, um, even though this has been a bit rambly and slow. Lots of love and talk very soon.